Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for being here today. You've got me somewhere between Senator Klobuchar and the Deputy Attorney General. Um, so it's a treat to be back at the State of the Net Conference. And a special thank you to the Internet Education Foundation for having me. And thank you for the good work you do to foster conversation about Internet policy. Now up front, I think I need a disclaimer. As a commissioner at the FCC, speaking at the State of the Net conference, I'm going to defy some expectations today. I'm not going to talk about net neutrality. I support net neutrality. I voted against last month's decision to roll back those rules. I made a ruckus. And there's no shortage of places where you can read my heated and sometimes fiery take on what happened. But today, instead of talking about the substance of net neutrality, I want to use it as a launching pad. And I want to go big and discuss policymaking in the internet era. I want to talk about some shortcomings in our civic infrastructure, because I think we need to make some real changes if we want to give the public a fair shot at getting through to those who make decisions in Washington. And yeah, that's some lofty stuff. So let me start small. Let me start with three quick stories about three individuals. First story. Ketchikan is the largest city in southern Alaska. And by largest city, I mean it's got 8,000 residents. And Ketchikan is nestled right at the entrance to Alaska's Inside Passage, which is a network of waterways which provides access to some of the state's most idyllic scenery. The area is known for its thriving fishing industry, for having the world's largest collection of standing totem poles, and the Misty Fjords National Monument. So no surprise, it's a regular stop on the cruise ship circuit. And the charm of this area brought Carl Amelon up from the lower 48, when in 1995, he assumed the position of Ketchikan's chief administrative officer. For more than two decades, he has quietly helped run the city ensuring that residents get the services they need from local authorities. He was surprised in December when the local radio station found his name on a comment in the FCC public record, asking the agency to repeal net neutrality. As he told the station, he definitely did not submit a comment. Poking around a bit more, the station found that just shy of 900 comments were submitted to the FCC from little old Ketchikan. As another official in the city mused, you know, it's really, really unlikely that so many public comments were authored by the residents of this little Alaskan hamlet. They look fake, and something looks wrong. All right, second story. Jessica Lintz lives in Blossvale, New York. That's in upstate, about midway between Utica and Syracuse. It has one elementary school and one very active Boy Scouts troop. Jessica Lintz is assistant scoutmaster. And it's a role she takes seriously. As part of her commitment to the troop, she says she is very careful not to express political positions to the scouts she oversees. So she was surprised and angry to find her identity had been stolen and used to file a comment in the FCC record regarding net neutrality. She asked, quite pointedly, how the hell is this possible? Now, third story. Lake Bluff is located in northern Illinois. It's a little more than an hour north of Chicago. It's a picture-perfect Midwestern small town, complete with a village green and a little beach along the shores of Lake Michigan. In fact, during the First World War, it was proclaimed the most patriotic town in America for the efforts of its residents to support our troops abroad. Donna Duthie made her home in Lake Bluff. And in June of this year, she filed a comment in the FCC public record. Her filing began 
Hi, I'd like to comment on internet freedom. She went on to ask the agency to repeal its net neutrality policies, calling them an exploitation of the open internet. This was stunning for those who knew her because she died more than 12 years ago. So those are three brief tales. But their stories are not unique because people from across the country, from every political persuasion and walk of life have found their names, addresses, and identities stolen and used to file fake comments in the FCC net neutrality proceeding. They include Senator Jeff Merkley, USA Today columnist Edward Baig, deceased actress Patty Duke, a 13-year-old in northern New York, and a 96-year-old World War II veteran in Southern California. In fact, at last count, two million individuals have been the victims of identity theft with filings in our record that they never wrote, sent, or authorized. These comments are not the only odd and unnerving thing in the FCC record. Nearly half a million of our comments come from Russian email addresses. Just under 8 million comments were submitted from email domains attributed to, and this is not subtle, fakemailgenerator.com. <laughs> Just over a million comments were submitted using mail merge techniques that are designed to make them appear like unique submissions. Everywhere you look, there is something strange. Something's not right. And what is wrong here is actually not confined to the FCC. So let me offer a few more stories from other agencies to demonstrate. A while back, the Department of Labor proposed a policy that would require investment advisors working with retirement accounts to act in the best interest of their clients. The fiduciary rule, as it's known, is slated for full implementation next year in 2019. And in the meantime, the Department of Labor is gathering feedback on the likely impact of this rule. On the one hand, you've got insurance companies and brokerage firms who contend that it could add new costs and make it harder to serve clients who have small nest eggs. On the other hand, consumer groups point out that without this rule in place, retirees could be saddled with purchasing investment products with high commissions that are not actually in their best interest. The back and forth at the Department of Labor has been fierce. And among the comments you'll find, one from Robert Schubert of Devon, Pennsylvania, that makes crystal clear he opposes the fiduciary rule. He writes, I do not need, do not want, and object to any federal interference in my retirement planning. But this filing was a fraud. Confronted with it, Robert Schubert said he was disgusted people can post comments using his name. But his experience is not unusual. A brief survey conducted for the Wall Street Journal found that two in five comments involving the fiduciary rule involve stolen names, addresses, phone numbers, and emails. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has been swamped with comments about payday lending. Last year, the CFPB adopted new rules designed to curb abuse in the $50 billion short-term loan industry. This year, however, the CFPB announced it will revisit and reconsider those rules. And let's be honest, the back and forth here has been messy. So has the public record. Ashley Marie Morales of Fresno, California was surprised to see a comment posted under her name in it she offered a personal anecdote about how helpful a payday loan was when she had unexpected and expensive car repairs. She knew instantly it was a fake because her family owns an auto body shop and it's the one place where she doesn't have to pay. Her filing wasn't the only irregularity in the record. At last count, there were more than 4,000 fake comments like hers that had been submitted. All right, the Securities and Exchange Commission, it's reviewing the sale of the Chicago Stock Exchange to an investor group with ties to China. The public record has some curious filings, including one from John Siccarelli 
on behalf of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. It raised concerns about the proposed ownership structure, suggested it would facilitate money laundering, which sounds bad. The only problem is that Dave Kaplan, the executive director of the network, says the letter was a fraud, but you can still find it in the SEC record. Final story. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission approved the Nexus Natural Gas Pipeline last year. This is a 255-mile pipeline that will carry natural gas from the Utica and Marcellus shales to users in places like Ohio and Michigan. And while evaluating this pipeline, FERC asked for comment on its merits. Landowners and residents along the Nexus pipeline route weren't shy about offering their concern. But Mary England of Rising Sun, Ohio, was surprised to see that her husband, Glenn, sent a letter to the FERC supporting the pipeline route in the Buckeye State. Her surprise was more than substantive because her husband died in 1998. And this was by no means the only suspect filing in the record because others in Ohio and Michigan have complained to FERC that they did not write the pro-pipeline letters posted in their names. Okay, that's a lot of stories. So let's review. We know that five agencies, the FCC, the Department of Labor, the CFPB, the SEC, and FERC, a lot of alphabet soup, have had problems with stolen identities and fake comments in the public record. But I suspect they are not the only ones. You see, the Administrative Procedure Act is a law from 1946. As attorneys at all of these agencies know, it's the law that sets up the basic framework for rulemaking. When a government agency proposes new policies, it has a duty to give interested persons an opportunity to voice their opinion. And after considering these public comments, agencies may adopt final rules, and they do so when it includes a general statement of basis and purpose. And that structure, it served us well for decades. It's been the rock solid foundation for so many agency rulemakings that seek public input for its decisions. Now over time, when we have identified deficiencies in this framework, we've made adjustments. And as a result, in 1980, the Regulatory Flexibility Act amended the Administrative Procedure Act to make sure that agencies consider the impact of proposed rules on small business. And we've got other laws, like the Paperwork Reduction Act, which doesn't really reduce paperwork, but anyway, and Unfunded Mandate Reforms Act, which have also changed this framework to respond to new comments and new concerns. But what we're facing now does not reflect what has come before. Because it's apparent the civic infrastructure we have for accepting public comment in the rulemaking process is not built for the digital age. As the Administrative Conference of the United States acknowledges, while the basic framework for rulemaking from 1946 has stayed the same, the technological landscape has evolved dramatically. No kidding. Now, this problem may seem small, but I think the impact is big. Administrative decisions made in Washington affect so much of our day-to-day -day life. They involve everything from internet openness to retirement planning to the availability of loans and the energy sources that power our homes and businesses. So much of the decision-making that affects our future takes place not just here in Congress, but in fact in the administrative state. The American public deserves a fair shot at participating in those decisions. Expert agencies are duty-bound to hear from everyone, not just those who can afford to pay for expert lawyers and lobbyists. The framework from the Administrative Procedures Act is designed to serve the public by seeking their input, but increasingly they are getting shut out. Our agency internet systems are ill-equipped to handle the mass automation and fraud 
that is corrupting our channels for public comment. It's only going to get worse. The mechanization and weaponization of the comment filing process has only just begun. We need to do something about it. Because ensuring the public has a say in what happens in Washington matters. Because trust in public institutions matters. You know, last week, Edelman released its annual trust barometer and reported that only a third of Americans trust the government. That's a 14 percentage point decline from last year. Fixing that decline is worth the effort. And we can start with finding ways that give all Americans, no matter who they are or where they live, a fighting chance at making Washington listen to what they think. We can't give in to the easy cynicism that results when our public channels are flooded with comments from dead people, stolen identities, batches of bogus filings, and commentary that originated from Russian email addresses. We can't let this deluge of fake filings further delegitimize Washington and erode public trust. No one said digital age democracy was going to be easy. But we've got to brace ourselves and strengthen our civic infrastructure to withstand what is already underway. This is true at regulatory agencies and across our political landscape. Because if you look for them, you will find uneasy parallels between the flood of fake comments in regulatory proceedings and the barrage of posts on social media that was part of a conspicuous campaign to influence our last election. There is a concerted effort to exploit our openness. It deserves a concerted response. This has not yet happened. At the FCC, for instance, anyone who has found their name stolen and misused in the net neutrality record has been, a file, has been advised to file another statement to that effect in the public docket. Let me put this as gently as I can. This is not a scalable solution. The FCC has also refused to work with state authorities like the Attorney General of New York, who has found that tens of thousands of residents in his state, as well as in California, Georgia, Missouri, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Texas, have had their identities stolen. This is not right. For starters, I think it's at odds with the basic spirit of cooperative federalism. But more critically, the theft of identities like this is often a violation of state law. And for the record, it's also a violation of federal law. Section 1001 of Title 18 makes it a felony for any person to knowingly or willfully make any materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or representation in matters before the federal government. It makes the unwillingness of our regulators in Washington to address the fraud we already know exists especially chilling. Now for some good news. Earlier this month, the Government Accountability Office wrote to Congressman Frank Pallone announcing that in a response that he made along with some of his colleagues, they would be reviewing the extent and pervasiveness of fraud and the misuse of American identities in the federal rulemaking process. That's a start. So stay tuned. But it's not enough. We need a lot more investigating from the Department of Justice and Federal Bureau of Investigation because we are looking at a systemic effort to corrupt the process by which the public participates in some of the biggest decisions that are made in Washington. If we want to build the civic infrastructure to withstand this assault, we need to both understand its origins and take out the rogues who are stealing identities, cheating the public, and destroying our trust. Plus, while we build this civic infrastructure, we can take some pretty basic steps to improve the rulemaking process. Every agency should perform its own internal investigation. Every agency should consider simple security measures like CAPTCHA or two-factor authentication 
that enhance security without decreasing public participation. And every agency can do something old fashioned. They can hold public hearings. But the truth is we need to get started because it's what good governance and digital age democracy requires. Thank you. Sure. Gabe Goldberg, freelance technology writer. Across the agencies that you mentioned with all of those different phony comments being made on such disparate issues, is there any thinking on who's behind it? Did somebody buy a botnet? Did somebody buy a fraud net? Was it Russia picking an, ad, an issue and a side at random just to mess things up? Or is there a deeper conspiracy where it was people with an interest in the issues at hand finding a way to submit all those fraudulent comments? Those are terrific questions, really good questions. I think my point right now is I don't have an answer to them, but I think it is incumbent upon agencies in Washington to get to the bottom of it because we're going to have to build systems can, that can withstand this assault. And in order to do so, we need to know where this is all coming from. Oh, I've silenced you. <laughs> almost, almost. Thank you for your presentation. It's a wonderful way to end the day. Uh, my name is Laura Lai Kelly. I'm at Georgetown at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation. Um, I work on, uh, right now, a research project, which is how members of Congress are crowdsourcing expert capacity into their districts. Um, you might know that um, crowd law and other ways of opening up knowledge seeking and deliberation is happening around the world. And actually the United States uh, is behind other countries when it comes to uh, inclusivity in the deliberative process, both at the executive branch level and the agencies, certainly in Congress. Um, I'm wondering, have you um, had a chance to examine any of that and see what might match up or integrate best with uh, the American system. I know, for example, that parliaments have a much easier time uh, doing this kind of, of um, reconfiguration than Congress, which is the most complex, powerful, complicated legislative creature in the world, really. Um, so that's the question is, where are your favorite examples? And how can we see ourselves sort of in the scheme of things? Oh, these are all good questions. I think most agencies in Washington are constrained right now by this law from 1946, the Administrative Procedures Act. And the updates that have been made to the law over time have been fairly modest. They fixed a failure to look closely, for instance, at how small businesses are impacted by proposed rules, things like that. I think what I'm talking about is more fundamental. And I think every agency that interfaces with the public and creates what is really democratizing the opportunity for the public to file something just by virtue of them having a broadband connection, we're going to have to rethink that interface. We need it to be accessible to all, but we also need to make sure there's some fraud prevention that we think about from the get-go. And I'm open to any and all ways to think about how we can come up with a good way to do that, be it crowdsourcing or something else. Hi, I'm Jane Smith-Patterson from North Carolina. Speaking of networks, <laughs> um, is it possible for you and the FCC to think about considering additional funding for Healthcare Connect, being as that we're at a, a cap right now, the $400 million, and the fact that we have so many elderly across the country and getting to them with healthcare is gonna be the way they get care in many ways? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. There was a time when telemedicine was reserved for our most rural areas where it was hard to get doctors and specialists to show. But the truth is telemedicine is now a part of mainstream modern medicine and it's got extraordinary benefits for those who wish to age in place. And the FCC in late last year started a new rulemaking to update its existing rural health care programs to try to address the growing demand and also think a little bit more thoughtfully about how to push those dollars out there in the future. So there's an open proceeding on just that issue underway right now, and it's really important. Uh, 
thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Nathaniel Fruchter, graduate student at MIT. Um, I'm curious, given your stated need for investigation and sort of, you know, this cross-cutting expertise on fraud detection and improving these systems across agencies, how do you think we should find and position the talent that's needed to do this across the federal government, given you need people with expert He's in uh, data science and, you know, investigative journalism maybe in doing this sort of deep background work, but also the technical work necessary to shore up these systems. You know, you've probably heard it before, but I do think, like most people, we need more technologists in the United States government. It is how we interface with the public right now, and it's more than just needing more of them in volume. We actually need them to be participants in the most basic decision making because coming up with a perfect package of policies is pretty useless if you can't figure out a good way to make sure that the public can access them and participate in them and use them. And so I think that that is a long-term project, but it's my hope that we develop more programs to bring people in to government and public service over time with really deep technology backgrounds. Jerry Berman with the Internet Education Foundation. With those comments at the FCC, how long did it take you, since the comments were coming in for a very long time, for you to figure out that when you're getting 9,000 comments from Oshkosh, something is wrong? Yeah. This is a great question. And the honest truth is I gave you what I understand it to be today. But what we found in my office of just a handful of people is limited to our research capabilities. We need more experts on the outside coming through that record and identifying problems. I've made very clear, along with the help of folks like the New York Attorney General, that we've got two million individuals whose identities were stolen. You can do some easy counting to figure out how much is from foreign addresses, like I described those from Russia, about half a million. But we need many other outside experts to look at this record and help us identify the problems that we should focus on because I think that there is more here than even what I've described to you today. And again, I think it's incumbent upon us to get to the bottom of it and figure it out. Okay. All right. Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you all.